All right, we made it to Revelation 7, and now we get to a, uh, an interesting passage of Scripture in the terms of prophecy, biblical uh, end times prophecy. is about the 144,000, and obviously there's a lot of different views out there, and uh, I'll talk about some of those views in a minute, but let me just remind you, my uh, rule of thumb as I'm reading the Bible is to just take it literally. Right. Most most of what the Bible says, you can just take it. Hey, this is explaining the way something looked. Hey, that's what they saw. And you can take it literally. Obviously, there's sometimes you're forced to take something with a little more of a metaphoric, uh, you know, but, but usually if that's to be taken metaphorically, like a parable or something like that, there's an explanation given as to what that stands for or something like that. But a lot of times there's just something said. And uh, I believe many people try too hard to, to spiritualize it w instead of just taking it as, as face value. And, uh, and I struggled with that a little bit in Revelation 1. If you remember uh, back there at the end of that chapter, it talks about this vision of Jesus. And it talks about his eyes uh, being like, like fire. And then there's this, his feet are like brass. Is the sword comes out of his mouth, and I'm thinking that's got to be symbolic, right? Till I started thinking about all the visions of heaven and the way cherubim look, and the way all the prophets, when they see a vision of heaven, they see the fire, they see all these kinds of things. The only thing I couldn't get in my mind is what's that sword, and I still don't know exactly. But then I was thinking, well, if I'm going to take it literally, there's a sword coming out of his mouth. That doesn't mean like his tongue's like this big long two-edged sword, but there's some sword that's proceeding out of out of his mouth and and I thought back to Genesis chapter uh, the end of two I guess it is or no it would be uh, I think the end of three or into chapter four where the cherubim are there guarding the uh, the Garden of Eden and, and, and he put cherubim outside there to guard the garden and it says and there went a flaming sword that went every which way or I, I'm paraphrasing it but it went every which way to guard the uh, the garden. I remember reading that thinking, well, that's weird. There's just like this random sword that's just sitting there and going different directions or something like that. Maybe this is a literal <laughs> sword that Jesus uses. I don't know, but I have no reason to make it symbolic. It could be symbolic, but I have no reason to make it symbolic. Now, in that vision, he does say that there were these seven candlesticks and these seven stars, but then it tells you what those are. It says that they're the churches and then the stars are the angels of the seven churches. And so for the most part, I try to look at it literally. So when we come to Revelation 7 and we see these uh, specific people coming out of these literal tribes of, uh, of Jacob, I take that literal. And so the problem with that is that creates a lot of problems in the sense of you know, I was looking up uh, a while back how many people live in uh, live in that area right now in Jerusalem today that are that are actually Jewish. OK, and then you have to take that and say, well, some of those are just secularized Jews. They call themselves Jews, but they, they're not religious of any nature. And then there are, uh, uh, you know, these who claim to be religious Jews. You know, but but that's the number gets really, really small. And you're thinking, how do you get 12,000 from each tribe? Right. And so some people say, well, the tribes have been scattered throughout the world and you don't know, really know where they are. And I'm thinking, oh, you mean like they've mixed with other races? So I could be Jew. Right. If that's what you're saying, like I'm from a certain tribe of, <laughs> you know, now you've got a really interesting interpretation of the Bible. OK, so. So I'm going to explain to this afternoon what I think is the biblical uh, understanding of this from a very literal interpretation. And I don't think I'm alone. I know that there are other people that believe at least similar to this. And, uh, and so I'm not making up some kind of weird thing. But I'm going to first explain some of the uh, thoughts that are out there. Because it is an interesting passage. A little bit, it's not like super clear who it's talking about. And again, if you're looking at the nation today... Or, you know, and, and, and let me just say this, that a lot of biblical uh, uh, commentators today, when it comes to end times, they'll say, you know, well, at all, they went back into the land in 1948, right? 
1948, all these Jews went back into the land. And so imagine trying to interpret this then before 1948. <laughs> and it would be so confusing trying to figure out, we don't even know who the tribes are. You can ask Jews today. They say, well, there's, nobody knows who the tribes are. And, uh, and they're all uh, scattered around and, and what have you. But I believe, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I believe they are literally the, from the different tribes of, uh, of Jacob. <clears throat> now, here are some of the views. You've perhaps heard this one before. It's 144,000 faithful Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> from the day of Pentecost till present day. They're Jehovah's Witnesses. And here's an interesting thing. What we see about the 144,000, they're actually on earth, like literally on earth, right? And I believe Jehovah's Witnesses say that the 144,000 are the only ones that are going to be in heaven. And you have a chance of living forever on earth. That's like the best chance you have because you're not one of the 144,000, but the 144,000 will actually get to heaven. Very strange, uh, strange view. Yeah. Certainly a strange interpretation of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, you know that... We don't see that in the Bible, but that is something that is a common. If you look up the 144,000, I can almost guarantee you uh, on, on Google or something like that, the first thing that's going to come up is 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Because that's the common view, most, uh, often talked about and what have you. Okay, a second view, and I believe this is a Mormon view, the Latter-day Saints view that uh, the high priests from all over the world, I'm assuming that the high priests of, of the Mormons, you know, then they make up the 144,000. Why? Well, because some elder said so, and they just believe, believe it, I guess, because you certainly don't see it in the Bible. And perhaps their uh, Book of Mormon says something more about it. I don't know, but uh, you don't get that from the Bible, okay? Now, here's a more common view uh, that I have heard, and that is that the 144,000 are symbolic of all God's people, right? Or even in the tribulation, saints of, uh, of, in the tribulation, and when I say tribulation prophetically, I'm talking about what people normally call, they don't understand uh, tribulation and they make it the whole seven years or something like that. But they'll say out of that seven years, these all the people that got saved, you know, represent, uh, uh, spiritually represent all these uh, different, different people. Anyway, I don't even want to spend a lot of time on that, but I already told you that I'm not looking at it symbolically or trying to spiritualize it. I think uh, let's see if it can first be taken literal because I think it can. And so this is what is most common, and I heard this growing up, though I could never make sense out of it. And most common what I hear among Baptists and even evangelicals is that the 144,000 are actually the 12 from the 12 tribes, and that these are Jews that are going to like be converted to Christianity in the, in the tribulation. It's about pretty much what everybody's heard that growing up in their, in their life. That's pretty much the view that I heard. Okay, and again, that creates some problems because you're wondering, like, where are they coming from? You know, we're going to read later on when we get to that part uh, that these are male. They're, these 144,000 are all male Jews who are virgins. And it's like, okay, so now, you, now you're just limited even more, you know, from these different tribes which don't even exist, that are scattered all around the world, uh, but you're going to, you know, uh, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So it can't be, uh, I don't think there's any chance that it can be, have anything to do with people that exist today by blood or by their religion being Jewish. It doesn't make any sense. But I do take a literal view. However, how could I take a literal view and not believe that these people are going to get saved in the tribulation or whatever? Well, because I believe that these people are already dead. <laughs> these people are already dead. Look at e Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. <clears throat> I'm, I, I, I will always remember this passage of Scripture, this story. And I always remember as, as the story that this guy came to me at my door one time I had been talking to him. And the day before, I had been just sharing the gospel with him, but I didn't get super far. And the next day, he, or I don't know, maybe a week later, comes to my door with a Bible in his hand and says, you know, can you tell me what the Valley of the Dry Bones is all about? And to this day, man, I regret that I, 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 I pushed it off and I said, let me come back and talk to you later. 
and you've probably heard the story. I come back the next day, and he's gone. He had to leave town, and uh, and I, I regret that because there's a guy had a Bible in his a guy that I was trying to witness to had a Bible in his hand, came to my door, and I didn't talk to him about salvation. I didn't go. I just said, "Hey, I'm busy right now. Uh, let me come back to you tomorrow." And uh, and anyway, so I, so this this I always think about that whenever I read this. But he read this story of the Valley of of the Dry Bones and said. That's a weird story. What, what does that mean? And let me just read it to you real, real quickly. Uh, at least we'll just read the first 14 verses anyway. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out of the, out of, uh, in the spirit of the Lord. Now let me remind you, Ezekiel is seeing a vision. Okay, He's in captivity. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had come. The Babylonians had, had taken them into captivity. And now God's allowing him to see all these visions, and he's going to preach what he sees to the people, okay? And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there was very many in the, uh, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. So we're talking about bones of people who had been dead a long time, okay? And he's seeing a vision of these bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I uh, was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. And there was no breath in them. Then saith he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in to them. And they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and will bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land, then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. You say, you think that's talking about the 144,000? No, I think that's talking about Old Testament saints that are going to be resurrected one day, who were literally children of Israel. <laughs> okay, And so as we read in the Bible, uh, it's not long before we see in the New Testament this talk about a resurrection. Even in the Old Testament, it talks about the resurrection. But look at 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And you know this, a, a, a very popular passage of Scripture. Uh, in fact, I think we should back up a little bit here. Let's go to 13. This is usually where we start when we read this passage. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that ye which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So in what I'm calling the resurrection, because I think that's the accurate uh, description and, and word, of uh, when Jesus comes back and receives us, and people literally rise up out of the grave, it's a resurrection, right? We're dead, now they're resurrected. And they're given glorified bodies. And let's say we are alive and remain until that day. You know, we get a glorified body as well, but we weren't in the earth. We weren't dead. We didn't have the dry bones that have been dead for, for a long period of time. These are rising up. We just get to go up with, these, with, with this other group. Is that what you read in 1 Thessalonians? So, uh, so we see uh, you're wanting to know where, where are these 144 a thousand coming from. Look at Revelation again. And remember that uh, passage of Scripture I just read in Ezekiel. I want to turn there again. You don't have to turn there, but I want to make sure I quote this right. He said, uh, when he was prophesying for the... Uh, for them to have breath, he says, prophesy and say, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. That's interesting terminology, right? Now let's look at Revelation 7. And after those things, I saw, uh, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with, cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given not to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now let me get up to speed in case anyone has kind of forgotten where we are. Uh, we are now opening the seals. All right. As we see uh, last week, we talked about John has got this vision. And now he's in heaven, and he's going to prophesy of the things which should come hereafter, right? He had already talked about the churches, the seven churches in Asia. Now he's going to prophesy about things that are going to happen hereafter. And he sees this uh, book, and the book has the seals. We I told you how the book is uh, in that time would have been a scroll, mo uh, most likely. And in this book, it's got seven seals on it. And so last week we went through each of the, the first six seals, and I said, something special happens when he opens up that last seal. You know, the idea, I believe, is that now you can open up what was inside that book. And when you open that up, you're going to see all these events that are going to happen where seven judgments are going to uh, uh, come out and all that. We'll get to that point. But we haven't even opened up that last seal yet. We've only gotten to this to this last seal. Right before that last seal is open, what we saw is there was something a uh, very uh, supernatural happening in the atmosphere and the sun being darkened and the moon being darkened and, and, uh, and all of a sudden everybody knows something's going on and people in heaven are getting excited because the great day of the Lord's coming and the people uh, that are on the earth are getting scared and they're hiding in the rocks and the, in the caves and saying fall on us because this is a very big time and it says the day of the, the wrath of the Lord is coming his, the great day of his wrath and that's where we left off at into chapter 6. And then when we start in, in chapter 7, the seal still hasn't been opened yet. Okay, And so before he opens that seal, we know, because we've read ahead of this, that when he opens that seal, a lot of, a lot of uh, God's wrath is going to be poured out. A lot of heavy, heavy judgments upon this earth are going to be poured out. So before those are poured out, he's, he says there's going to be 144,000 that are going to be here. And they're going to have to be sealed, all right? And so he says, uh, you know, not to hurt them, uh, hurt not the earth, verse 3, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Okay, so before that final seal is broken and the wrath of God's poured out, we already talked about how I believe that it was right before this seal is open uh, that, or right around this same time that uh, the rapture takes place. All right, and I'm going to show that again here in a minute. So, uh, uh, so, so anyway, but before that happens, he's John is seeing all these people uh, in heaven. 
<clears throat> now, you might ask yourself, what about this sealing? It's, it's an odd thing. Like, what, what, why does he have to seal them? What, why, why talk about the seal? Like, why not just say, you know, don't hurt, don't hurt the, the 144,000 or they're going to be in a certain location, pour your wrath everywhere else, but, but just not there, you know, kind of like when the plagues of Egypt are being poured out and God's people were spared, you know, during that time. <clears throat> but look back at Ezekiel again. Now this time go to Ezekiel 8. Or actually Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. There's a lot of crazy stuff in Ezekiel, and I can't give you uh, all of it, but a lot of it... Uh, a lot of it lines up with prophecy, and here, here's the reason why. Okay, during the same time, uh, and I'm going to talk about this tonight in Iola, but during the same time, Daniel, or, or, or shortly before this, Daniel is, is living during this time as well, and he is in Nebuchadnezzar. Like, I mean, he is in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had taken the, the Hebrew children and uh, made them eunuchs and took them in to be their servants, okay? Now, Daniel interprets a dream from the king, and he sees this statue. The statue's got a gold head, right? And then it's got a silver chest and arms, and then it's got uh, uh, iron legs, and I missed one, I think, but uh, then it's got like iron feet mixed with clay. And you remember that vision, okay? And this, he says, is representative. Whenever Daniel gives the interpretation, he says, this is representative. Your great kingdom, the Babylonian Empire, represents that head okay and then he said there's going to be another kingdom that's going to come and rule rule over and it's the medes and the persians seems pretty uh, pretty much of uh, it doesn't i don't think it's a coincidence that he's it's the arms as well as the chest so you got the medes and the persians you know uh, that's probably what it is because you have to look back at this point and look at history and see who were the empires that came because we didn't know at that point Dave, daniel only knew the babylonian empire was there but the ones that rose up after him were the Medes and the Persians. After that, the Greek Empire ruled and reigned over, over everybody. And then, of course, the Roman Empire from which Jesus came. And so that's an, we'll talk about that vision on another time. But, uh, but so all, there's always been these kingdoms that are ruling and reigning. And, uh, and it makes sense that in Ezekiel, he's giving him these visions saying, like, Jerusalem is totally going to be destroyed. You know, you guys are going to go into captivity into Babylon and, and you're, you're, you're held captive there. And he's like basically saying it's because you guys continue to go against me and everything. And he's like, I'm going to destroy all of you guys. Now, this is symbolic of what's going to happen in future kingdoms as well. Because in the Roman Empire, this happened after the, after the resurrection uh, in 70 AD. Situation almost exactly like this happened. Right? But all these things are picturing what's going to happen on a larger scale in the last days, the last of the last days, okay, which haven't come yet. And so all these things, hey, this is just, everything is foreshadowing what's going to happen. Okay, so look at e Ezekiel 9. He's given him this vision saying that he's going to destroy this city. It says, He cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Don't you love that term, the destroying weapon? I just love it. And behold, six men came from the way of the high, higher gate. Now, this is not going to line up perfectly, but I want you to see a similarity. Which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. Destroying weapon, slaughter weapon, I don't know which one's better. And one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshing, thresh, uh, threshold of the house. I've talked about this vision of the cherubim and, and, uh, and God sitting on the throne there in, in past pa uh, messages. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. 
And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maid and little children and women, but, uh, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Now, I suppose there's probably a lot of prophetic things you can pull out of this passage of Scripture. But I just want you to see that similarity. This idea of those, and of course, Ezekiel is going to say that he was one of those men remaining. Of course, we would say, obviously, Daniel, Jeremiah, other people like that would have been remaining during that time. People that were still godly men who loved the Lord. But yet, all these other people in, in this vision that he's seeing, you know, were just destroyed, right? Except those who had the mark on their forehead. Doesn't that sound very similar to what happens in, uh, in Revelation 7? Okay, so let's go back to Revelation 7. <clears throat> so I wanted you to see where they came from, okay? And I believe they came in the resurrection. I'm going to show you that a little bit more here in a minute. I wanted you to see what, uh, why they were sealed. You know, that's, they're sealed so that they're not destroyed when the wrath of God's poured out. Because after that seventh seal is open, what's going to happen? God's wrath is going to be poured out. All right. Now, the last thing I want to show you, uh, well, not the last thing, but the next thing I want to show you is what is their purpose for being here? What's their job going to be? Okay. Why are the 144,000 even going to be here? We know this in chapter 7, in verse 3, it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor uh, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So we know these are servants of God. Whatever they're going to do is some sort of service uh, to the Lord. And if you flip over to chapter 14, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the division here, but at chapter 12, there's kind of a division, and you can really easily lay these stories on top of each other and see that he's kind of telling these stories again. And when you get to chapter 14, you're going to see the, the vision of the 144,000 again. Uh, and it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters, and as a voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Okay, so we see there that these followed. Uh, they basically were before the Lord everywhere that the Lord went. Uh, and they got the, uh, the, his name on their foreheads. And uh, and their their servants, we see all these kind of things talking about them. Don't know exactly what they're doing, but I believe that they're. At, if you compare scripture with scripture, I believe they're here at the same time as the two witnesses. Look at Revelation 11. It's a whole lot on here, man. I know I'm throwing a bunch out. I'm hoping that most people already have a general idea of this, so that I'm 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 helping you. Okay, but Revelation 11. In this passage, he's talking about these other guys, which are the, uh, uh, the two witnesses. Look at verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, we won't break down the exact number of the days, but doesn't that sound familiar? That's roughly three and a half years. Like we keep seeing this, there's, there's the clear division. First three and a half years, second three and a half years. And I believe these guys come... At the same time the 144,000 do, they're going to be alive during the second three and a half years when God's wrath is being poured out after that, that seventh seal is open. Okay, and so perhaps their job is like these two witnesses, right? Their job is clear by their title. They're witnesses. And I don't mean necessarily witnesses as in preaching the gospel, though I suspect they will be preaching. Uh, but they're also no doubt be preaching judgment because you see like fires coming out of their mouth and all this stuff like they're. They're preaching judgment, and I'm, I reckon the 144,000 also are preaching judgment, but perhaps they're also kind of witnesses, right? 
verifying or confirming what's going on and God's wrath being poured out and maybe even justifying uh, the, severe, the severity of the wrath that God's pouring out. Uh, look at, if you would, Luke chapter 11. Kind of got ahead of myself, but I think it'll still work. Okay, Luke chapter 11. In verse 49, well, why would God need witnesses while he's pouring out his wrath? Why do they have to be here if they're God's people and he's cause, calling judgment upon the earth? Why are the good people here? Like, why are the godly people, the servants of God here? Well, here's one possibility. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 49. <clears throat> Therefore... Also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Now, Jesus is preaching, and at that time, he's talking about all these prophets up until his time, you know, that these guys have killed. And he's saying, if you read that, he said that this is the wisdom of God. Okay, the wisdom of God in verse 49, that I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. Now, why would God want godly people to be slain and to be persecuted, right? The best thing I can come up with, because whenever you look at this, that that might be re the, sh the blood that was shed might be required of this generation. So the thing I can see is that when he's pouring out the wrath of God, you know, you've got this 144,000 given witness and you got these two witnesses, which they literally kill and they die and they leave them dead in the streets. We'll get to that here later on, but they're literally all over the whole world watching them at the same time, which incidentally, I'm sure for generations, people thought how in the world could the whole world be watching them at the same time now? We understand that. TV, Internet, uh, everybody's got a device in their pocket, even third world countries. They'll see these witnesses lying in the street somehow or another. Okay, why would they do that? Because they're like, like taking their, their wickedness to the next level so that God is actually justified. I mean, he's justified anyway, but I mean, it's like there's no doubt. And I can't help but think about the, uh, the flood you know, Noah's Ark and the flood and how God gave them 120 years. And while the Ark was preparing, God said, you know, I, I, I'm giving them 120 years. And we know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So like the way I see it, Noah is preaching for 120 years while he's building this Ark. And he's saying, hey, you know, judgment of God's coming. And he's going to destroy this earth with a flood for the wickedness and the violence. They're laughing, scoffing at him. What are you talking about, right? To the day that he finally says, I've been patient and long-suffering for 120 years, but no more. I'm pouring out my wrath. And before he pours out his wrath, what's he do? Takes his, the godly people that remain out. There's a resurrection of the dead, which he said was going to happen. There's a resurrection of those who are alive and remain. He, he leaves 144,000 of those who resurrected. We already talked about Old Testament saints are going to be risen too. So of those, I believe already 144,000 that are, that are destined, you know, predestined, if you will, to be part of the, uh, those servants. And, uh, and, and the rest of us are in, in heaven, perhaps watching the last three and a half years as God's wrath is poured out on the earth, Okay. But the 144,000 two witnesses are still here. Now, what is the result? Okay, what's the result? If they're here, 144,000, you, you know how big 144,000, I've talked about this before. I don't remember what it is, but like if a, a big football stadium or something like that. I mean, what, 40,000? I think one, a bigger one would be like 70,000. You know, there's probably some over maybe some over a hundred thousand but you a hundred and forty four thousand is a big number you know that's a lot of people but you know I don't know if they're scattered about the world if they're preaching what they're doing exactly but but these these people are left here let's say they are preaching 
Let's say, because that's what a lot of people believe, they're preaching the gospel and they're getting people saved. Okay? Now, let's say, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible where they're actually getting people saved, but let's say that they are. Well, why do, when we read, and I've already read these before, I'm not going to bring it up, uh, I'm not going to turn to the verses right now, but why do we see over and over again every judgment that's cast upon them, some great judgment, God opens up this, uh, or, the, or the angels blow this trumpet, and, there's this, and it says they repented not of their idolatry and their wickedness and all their abominations. They, they repented not, right? Later on, pour, opens up another seal. I mean, I'm not a seal, but another judgment. I mean, later on, there's vile judgment. Same thing. Uh, we see all those things. And after that, it says that they, they didn't turn. They would not turn to the Lord. Okay, now that sounds to me like people who are completely turned off to God. I mean, we would say they're of a reprobate mind, Romans 1. They, they do not see, they cannot believe, even if they see the miracles of God, even if they acknowledge that his judgment is being poured out on them. Doesn't it sound kind of like a Pharaoh, you know, in the plagues, uh, the plagues of Egypt, you know, all these plagues are being poured out on Pharaoh. And he's like, no, I'm still not going to acknowledge God. Who is he? Who is God? You know, and he's just and eventually he'll kind of succumb a little bit and say, OK, OK, hey, take them, whatever. Just get these plagues to stop. But as soon as he gets his opportunity, he goes right back after him again. Why? Because it says God hardened his heart. His heart was, he hardened his heart, and then God said, that's it. I'm done with you. Even if you see all these things happen, you know, you're still not going to believe, and, uh, and you've, been, you've been hardened. I personally believe in the last three and a half years of, uh, of, of God's, when God's wrath is being poured out, I don't see in the Bible anybody getting saved. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, yeah, people are getting saved, obviously. Maybe 144,000 are preaching the gospel. They're getting people saved. I don't see it. Uh, so you say, well, then who's going to be in the millennium? Well, a lot of saved people are going to be in the millennium for one thing. But then I do believe there will be some other in the millennium. Now, f for a while, this last week, I was reading this verse, and I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they are some people that got saved because look at Revelation 11. Remember, I told you there's a division here right before chapter 12. And so the way I understand this is as we get to the, the end of chapter 11, this is the end. And it even says uh, that the, uh, the temple of God is or the, uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, I can't I can't I can't find it right now. But uh, as we get to this this end of this after the seventh trumpet, we see like this is the end. OK, God opens in heaven. They see the temple and the ark uh, and all. But look at verse um, 13. And the same hour. Let's see. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake was slain of men 7,000. And the remnant was affrighted and gave God, uh, I'm sorry, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And I read that and I thought, well, all right, so there is a remnant. There's a remnant of people and they're giving God the glory. So maybe these are people that got saved. It's not the 144,000, you know. It says these 7,000 were slain and the remnant were affrighted, gave God the glory. But then I got to thinking, well, remnant isn't necessarily referring to Christians. Remnant just means like that which is left. And giving glory to God doesn't necessarily mean that, they're, that they got saved. right? I see it more like they're just saying, all right, mercy. All right, you win. We give up. <laughs> you know? And so after you read the, uh, beyond this, you see like this is the end. And, uh, and, and basically they go into the kingdom. Now, I believe after, 12, after tw uh, chapter 12, we begin to kind of see that. Uh, see that again. So why then would the 144,000, like I said, and the two witnesses, why even have them here? And I just, I really feel like the main reason for them is just to be a witness and a testimony to the righteousness of God. And while they're here, no doubt being persecuted, no, no doubt physically seeing. Remember when God sends the angels to, uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah? And it's like there's something about those angels actually seeing the wickedness that moved God to, to a point of his wrath where he was able to pour out his, his, uh, his wrath upon them. 
And so I believe that's the purpose of the 144,000. In chapter 7, we see them getting sealed right before the unsealing of the, uh, uh, of the book, the final unsealing of the book. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll start talking about these judgments that are going to happen. Now, this is the point where I believe we are all gone. Okay, As Christians, uh, we're all gone. 144,000 all remain. Let's go back to that one verse because I, I, it kind of alluded to it in Revelation 14. But let me see where that was in Revelation 7. <clears throat> okay. Now, some people will read, and again, mo a lot of people today, and tonight in Kansas and Iola, I don't have time to do it now, but tonight in Iola, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the, uh, the different views of the timing of the rapture, okay, going all the way back to the first century and all that. And it's an interesting study, okay? But here, since like the 1800s, there's been a rise to the belief that you know, there's a rapture, and then after the rapture is the, uh, the tribulation. And so they say, hey, the church is gone, and in chapter 4, you see all these people around the throne, and that's the raptured saints, okay? So all these seals and stuff are happening after the saints are gone. But I say rather, those are people that were just dead already, right? Throughout all generations beforehand, up in heaven. But in chapter 7... Again, he hasn't opened that seventh seal yet, but after the sixth seal, and after uh, we see a little interlude here, a pause break, if you will, where he sees all these 144,000, look at verse 9. He goes through all those different tribes, and then in verse 9 he says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the uh, elders of the four, uh, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forevermore. So I believe it's pretty clear that you got 144,000 that are going to stay on the earth. They get glorified bodies, right? But then I don't know if they go up to heaven and they come back down or they just get a glorified body and stay on earth. I don't know. Uh, and then we, anyone who is alive and remains, goes up to be with the Lord before that seventh seal is opened up, okay? And then all the things that we're going to talk about from this point on is after the rapture. We're gone, okay? And so uh, there's going to be some very frightening things. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you that we are not appointed unto wrath if we uh, have trusted in you. And uh, although we're not the 144,000, it's as though we are sealed in our foreheads with the name of the Lord and, and uh, sealed unto the day of redemption, as you have said. And we will never have to be exposed to that wrath. But we certainly know that you have promised that tribulation, trials, stuff will come. Even, even some will be martyred. Uh, for their faith and killed for their faith. But Lord, I pray uh, that you will uh, have mercy on us, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us boldness to preach your gospel while we still can and uh, take advantage of the opportunities to serve you and the freedom that we have. And, uh, and I pray that you'll bless this church and the efforts that we, uh, we give to you, that you be honored and glorified by it. That's our will in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.